In Ephesians 3, verse 21, Paul the Apostle says, Unto him be glory in the church. And we're going to talk about that in terms of what it means this morning. We're going to look at Psalm number 85. I'll walk you through that. We'll put it on the screen as well. But I would also, before we get started, I want to share a verse with you out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 3. This is a a great revival promise that uh, many over the years have used as a text to preach Uh, for revival. And it's a great passage. And the reason I'm sharing it will become clear as I get into the message. But notice what this says to us. Verse 3, Isaiah 44, 3. For I, meaning I, God, will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. And here's what he means. I will pour out of my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. Now, notice what he's saying there. For those who are thirsty and dry and need a fresh work of God in their life, uh, God says, I will pour out of my spirit on you and it will also impact your offspring your children, grandchildren, your descendants. This is uh, talking about the blessing of historical impact where because of one person, there is the blessing of God that begins to flow into and through a family. And it's amazing in its results. Remember what I shared with you about this blessing in the life of Jonathan and Sarah Edwards just a couple of weeks ago. Notice the promise of fruitfulness, verse 4. And they, that is your offspring and descendants, they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. That's a, a picture of life. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Would you like your son, your daughter to say that? I am the Lord's. And that one will call on the name of Jacob. Another will write on his hand. Here's a legitimate tattoo. (laughs) Belonging to the Lord. (laughs) Belonging to the Lord. Um, And will name Israel's name with honor. So this is talking about blessing from God on those who are thirsty that will have really a great, great impact upon others as well. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, in Psalm 85, this is a psalm written at a time when the people of Israel had come out of Babylonian captivity. They're back in the land. They were working hard at rebuilding Jerusalem and their fallen cities but everything has fallen down. And there's no, there's no oomph in their life spiritually. They're just preoccupied with the things of, of visual things of life. They, 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 are, they are God's people, but there's no fire. There's no invigorating life that animates them. And so in that context, this psalmist will pray. Notice verse 1. O Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the captivity of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your fury. You turned away from your burning anger. I want you to notice six times here he says you did this. You showed, you restored, you forgave, you covered, you withdrew, you turned. And so six times he's looking back at what what God did on previous occasions among his people in the nation of Israel. Uh, What he did for them in terms of favor, of uh, granting forgiveness, 
and showing his uh, redemptive power among them. So God has worked in the past among these people. And of course, in the last three weeks, this is similar to what I've been showing you. I've been showing you how God has moved in the history of our country in terms of revivals, in terms of spiritual awakenings. The truth is, our history is rich with a record of spiritual revival, Christian revival. And the truth is, not a lot of people know anything about it. I am amazed uh, how many people have come to me after I've given these last three messages on revival. I'm amazed at how many people have come to me and said, man, I, I never heard anything like that before. I never knew those things took place in our country. They did. Now, here's the question, though. Why does all of this even matter to us? It matters to us because when we know what God has done, it gives us hope and confidence to expect him to do it again. That's the bottom line. And so this psalmist is thinking here in verse 1 through 3. He's thinking along this line in these verses. And then in verse 4, he says, In effect, Lord, in light of what you have done, restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your indignation toward us to cease Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not yourself revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Now, it's interesting in verse 1 through 3, he uses the word you did or you showed or you did things in the past, he uses that term on six occasions. And then in these verses, he uses the word us six times. Notice, restore us, grant us, revive us, again and again. Now, the reason he prays in this way is because he is fully aware of something that is very important for us to remember about God. And that is the fact that God is immutable. Which means God does not change. Malachi 3.6, I the Lord your God, I change not. And because God has a history of reviving his people in the past, we can therefore expect him and call upon him to do it again and again. And so this really, this psalm is really a cry for God to act. Notice verse 6 again. He says, will you not yourself revive us again? By the way, the word revive here is a word that means to infuse with life to infuse with fresh life, to invigorate, to, to stir up, to animate with, with fresh life. So again, will you not yourself revive us again? And here's why, that your people may rejoice in you. It's interesting, this question is presented in such a way so as to expect a positive answer. Will you not? Surely you will. <laughs> Obviously you will, is the thinking. And then in verse 7, he continues, Show us, show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. And, and so the thought is, Lord, let us see with our eyes the great uh, love of God on display, in particular as it would melt the hearts of those who have become hardened toward God, of those who have become stiff and wooden 
and unanimated. Show us, Lord, your love upon the lives of people. It seems to me that this man, along with perhaps many others, are in a place, it's not that they are doubting the idea of God as love, but it's like they no longer sense it in their own lives. They no longer have that, the, the sense of God's love gripping them and turning them and animating them in their daily life. I think a lot of people are like that. The love of God is more of an idea or a concept than it is a felt reality, a felt experience. And then in verse 8, after laying out his case, the writer says, notice, I will hear what God the Lord will say. I like that because, as you can see, he fully expects God is going to answer. Uh, That's important. In fact, the thought is, basically, what will God say? That's something that I've been thinking about. How is God going to respond to us? Now, we are bringing up our level of discipleship around here. Uh, We're we're calling on people to pray more, to... uh, be more active in prayer. We're going to try to put together a plan of a prayer for the whole congregation to move together. Talk more about that next week. But what's going to happen? How will God answer? Remember our text, we're resting on Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to his power that works in us. Above all that we could ask or think, what will God do? What amazing things is he going to do as we pray? So notice again, I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. Uh, He seems to be saying, "I I know that God will do this because that's his nature. Uh, He will speak peace, but... Then he says, let them not turn back to folly. In other words, once you set your face to seek after God, don't go back to the mess. Don't go back to the place that got you in trouble in the beginning. Let no one turn back to folly. And then he says this, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. How near do you suppose? He is near to those who fear him. And then the last line, that glory may dwell in our land. Now that statement is a summary of what we mean by revival. Glory in the land is revival. Glory in the church. Glory in your home. Glory in your life. Glory in the workplace. Glory in the community. And in particular, glory in the church. That's exactly what we mean by the idea of revival. By the way, uh, this word glory used comes from the Hebrew word kabod. And kabod is a word that the, 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 the rabbis sort of uh, restated in the word shekinah. Shekinah is a term that we're all familiar with. Here's how one theologian describes glory. He writes, when God's glory appears, his actual status as supreme over all the rest of reality is seen and his impressiveness is felt. I I underline two words there, seen, visual, felt personal, subjective experience. The false appearances of this world are stripped away so that God stands forth in our sight as all-important, superior, and awesome. And his glorious greatness manifest in our midst is what sets the church apart from other merely ordinary forms of human association. His glory is our distinction. 
that, uh, th this makes us different than the Kiwanis Club or whatever club you're talking about. It's the fact that God's glory is among us. His glory is our distinction, or it should be. It's supposed to be, and yet at the same time, isn't it true? This is often the problem. The church is incubod, right? You know what that is. The glory departed. It's often true that what is missing in the church is this presence, this sense of glory, the glory of God. Or to put it another way, what's missing is the unmistakable supremacy and the powerful, awe-inspiring, holy presence of the living God. And so revival, you could say then, is the beginning of the recovery of the glory Glory in the land, glory in the church, glory on your face. The guy that led me to the Lord, some of you will remember him. That was the thing that I noticed about him that drew me when I first met him on the street. There was just a difference. There was a distinctive about him. It was the glory of God that radiated through his very demeanor, his presence. The glory of God was upon him. Now, look at verse, um, let me see, verse 10. Yeah, verse 10 through 13. This is the psalmist's perspective of what he means by the glory, by glory in the land. He's thinking now of the virtue of it or the impact of it. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. His point seems to be these are the qualities that flourish when glory is present, when glory is in the land. Verse 11, truth springs from the earth as opposed to wickedness, lying, truth. Truth is the idea here of integrity. God sees integrity among his people. Do you know what integrity is? Short definition. It's when your walk and your talk become one. That's integrity. It's when you become real with yourself and most of all with God. So truth and integrity springs from the earth. Righteousness looks down from heaven. God is watching Indeed, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its produce, a promise of fruitfulness, an expectation of it. And then verse 13 is interesting. Righteousness will go before him, that is God, and will make his footsteps into a way. Now, I have to admit, I struggled with this verse, trying to understand what he's getting at, looking at multiple uh, translations and trying to uh, figure this out. What it seems to me he's saying here is the thought that when God begins to move in revival blessing, as he moves, he lays out a clear pathway for people to follow. His ways become unmistakable. His movements become clear and lucid and unmistakable. He makes his footsteps, the way he's moving, he makes that into a way and it's clear to all. And so it seems to me, folks, the real question for you is are you interested in this glory? Are we as a church interested in this glory. Let me show you a couple of Old Testament passages that are very interesting. This is 2 Chronicles 7. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> this is uh, at the time when Solomon was praying uh, before all of Israel. He was dedicating the temple of the Lord. They had worked on this temple for seven years. 220,000 people 
were employed or used in the building of this temple. And finally it was done, the temple of the Lord. Now, he's dedicating that temple, and look what it says. Now, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priest could not enter into the house. Why? Because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. That's an interest. They couldn't do what they wanted to do because, well, look at the rest of this. All the sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshiped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. Notice what they uh, were made aware of in the presence of glory. It says they, they, they said God is good, his loving kindness. As we sang, he's a good, good father who loves his people. And that becomes very uh, accented or accentuated in the midst of this sense of glory. In fact, back in chapter 5, this is earlier uh, in this uh, experience of dedicating the temple. This is prior to the dedication prayer. They had offered sacrifices to God, and then verse 13 says, then the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. And here's what he means. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Now, it needs to be understood that what I'm reading here is Old Testament, Old Covenant. And of course, we presently live in the church age. This is the dispensation of the church age. Uh, This is the time of God's grace. It began on the day of Pentecost, and it will be uh, consummate at the time of the great rapture event. The church, the bride, will be taken up to meet the Lord in his presence forever. So we live now in the church age, and it's important for us to remember that it's not God that Uh, It's not the same as in the Old Covenant where God dwelt in a physical temple. In this dispensation of, of the church age, we are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so this picture that we're reading about here, an amazing scene... It's a picture of what God desires to do to us in terms of filling us with his presence, with his glory. And so again, the real question for us, I think, is are we interested in this glory, this glory of God? And if we are, then needless to say, the call of God upon us, I would reduce it down to three main things. Three, I said four, right? That's <laughs> three. First of all, prayer. Prayer, 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 and more prayer. Then there needs to be self-examination and deep repentance. And then, of course, what follows is trust, dedication, surrender, Faith, however you want to put it. Now, it begins, however, when God's people will pray. And with regard to prayer, I want to share with you this morning a story about revival that occurred in the year 1949. That was the year when I was born into this world. So this is within my lifetime. Uh, This story I'm, I'm going to share with you, by the way, is a documented account and documented not by one but by thousands of people who have affirmed that all of this is true. This revival in 1949 took place 
in the Hebrides of Scotland. In case you don't know where that is, here's a little visual. Notice on the left, in green, the island of Great Britain. And then to the north of the island is Scotland. And the Hebrides, it's, it's that area of land in the north, including some of the islands there. That's the area of the Hebrides. Now let me show you a picture of two, two old women who were prayer warriors who were the genesis of this revival. Here they are. On the right, on the left. Peggy and Christine Smith. Uh, Peggy, on the left, is a woman who is stricken with severe arthritis at this time. And her sister, Christine, on the right, is blind. She does not see, but these women know how to pray. This is their story. Peggy and Christine Smith of the Barvis Village, they would pray constantly for revival in their cottage on the Isle of Lewis, the largest of the Hebrides Islands in the northwest of Scotland. God showed Peggy in a dream that revival was coming. Now, in case you get a little bit uh, reticent here, a dream? Wait a minute. You should note that these are Presbyterians in the northwest of, uh, of, of Scotland. These people are Stoic, Calvinist uh, Presbyterians. They do not worship with any kind of display. They are very stoic in, their, in their, their presentation of themselves. So God shows Peggy in a dream that revival was coming. Months later, early one winter morning, as the sisters were praying, God gave them an unshakable conviction that revival was near. There was a special verse that seemed to grip them. That verse is the one that I led with. Isaiah 44, 3. I will pour out my spirit upon the persons who are thirsty. Water upon dry ground, remember? That was their verse. That was the verse that was their rhema from God. Now, as the story continues, they will pray and pray and pray. And then the, these two ladies, through their preacher, they will call upon this man to come and speak. His name is Duncan Campbell. He's known as a fiery uh, Scottish preacher. When he arrived, oh, by the way, I should tell you this. When they uh, sent a word to him about coming to their church, he said he couldn't do it. He said, maybe in another year or so, I would be able to come, but I'm just too busy. Well, he was actually speaking in another city, one of the uh, larger cities. He was speaking at a convention. And God moved upon his heart as he was sitting on the stage of that convention. And he, God spoke to him and said, you, you have to go in response to the request of those women. So after that meeting, he went straight to uh, this area, the area of Barvis. Now, when he arrived, he began to preach at the Barvis Presbyterian Church. And after his first service there, here's what happened. After the service, uh, Campbell and 30 other people retreat to a cottage, and they're going to be there most of the night in order to pray for the revival. Here are the words of Duncan Campbell. He said, after coming that very night, God was beginning to move. The heavens were opening. We were there on our faces before God. Three o'clock in the morning came and God swept in. About a dozen men and women lay prostrate on the floor, speechless. 
speechless. Something had happened. We were moving out of the realm of the common and the natural into the sphere of the supernatural. That's a very important distinction and statement. Something had happened. He could sense it. We knew that the forces of darkness were going to be driven back and men were going to be delivered. When we left the cottage at 4 a.m., we began to discover men and women seeking God. As I walked along the country road, we found three men on their faces crying to God for mercy. Now this is it was four in the morning. There was a light in every home. No one seemed to think of sleep. Do you see what's going on here? There was an awareness of God beginning to grip the whole community. And on the following day, the looms were silent. Uh, I think it means by that uh, looms that are used for fabricating clothing, etc., or cloth. Little work was done on farms as men and women gave themselves to thinking about eternal things and were gripped by eternal realities. People were meeting in groups. Young men were gathering in a field and beginning to talk and begin to talk about this strange consciousness of God that gripped the community. The Holy Spirit began to move among the people and one minister writing about what happened the following morning said this, you met God on meadow and moorland, you met him in the homes of the people, God seemed to be everywhere, everywhere. Now, Beginning here, I, I have to use the account of the biographer. I'm kind of mixing the autobiography and some of the biographer, uh, some of their accounts so that we can reduce it down to a, uh, a bite size for us. Look at this. On the next day when Duncan and his friends arrived at the church that morning, it was already crowded. By the way, it wasn't Sunday. It was a weekday. People had gathered from all over the island, some coming in buses and vans. No one discovered who told them to come. God led them. Large numbers were co converted as God's Spirit convicted multitudes of sin, many lying prostrate, many weeping. After that amazing day in the church, Duncan pronounced the benediction that night. But then afterward, a young man began to pray. He prayed, prayed, and prayed again until he fell again onto the floor in a trance. He lay there with me standing beside him for about five minutes. And then the doors of the church opened. And the local blacksmith came back into the church and said, Mr. Campbell, Mr. Campbell, something wonderful has happened. We were praying that God would pour water on the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground and listen, he's done it, he's done it. Will you come to the door and see the crowd that's here? Now look at this. I went to the door and even though it was 11 o'clock at night, there must have been a crowd of between six and 700 people gathered around the church. Now, where did the people come from? How did they know that a meeting was to be held in the church? Well, I cannot tell you, but I know this, that from village and hamlet, the people came. Were you to ask some of them today, what was it that moved you? They wouldn't be able to tell you. Only that they were moved by a power that they could not explain and the power was such as to make them realize that they were hell deserving sinners. And of course the only place they could think of where they might find help was at the church building. So here they were, between six and seven hundred of them. 
That very night, God swept down in Pentecostal power. And what happened in the early days of the apostles was now happening in the parish of Barvis. It's an amazing story. Look at this. This went on for five weeks with services from early morning till late at night or early in the morning. Then it spread to the neighboring parishes. What happened in Barvis was repeated over and over again. The sacred presence of God was everywhere. Sinners found themselves unable to escape it. It's an amazing story of God's miraculous power showing up and all of these people being moved on and all of the work of the Holy Spirit. That is what we on this side of Pentecost understand as the presence of the glory of God. I thought I would throw this in. Before the revival, Stornoway, this is one of the bigger cities in, uh, in the north there, Stornoway had one of the highest drinking rates in Scotland, along with flourishing illegal and unlicensed drinking places. After the revival, one publican mourned, the drink trade on the island is ruined. <laughs> when you have living water, nothing else will satisfy, right? This is the wisdom for us. I took this from... Duncan Campbell's account. He's speaking now to you and I. Those who seek God for a revival must be prepared for God to work in his own way and not according to their program. His sovereignty does not relieve man of responsibility. God is the God of revival, but man is the human agent through whom revival is possible. Desire for revival is one thing. Confident anticipation that their desire will be fulfilled is another. It takes the supernatural to break the bonds of the natural. You can make a church mission conscious. You can make a church crusade conscious. But only God can make a community God conscious. That's something we can't do. I can schedule and, and tell you about what we're scheduling. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. I can make you conscious of meetings ahead, but only God can move on your heart and make you aware of him. That's why the only solution to this thing called uh, revival or uh, this thing that we're asking God to do, give us his glory, give us revival. We must pray, folks. We have to pray, pray, and pray some more. In fact, here's a verse that they used at the uh, Bar Barvis Church, the Presbyterian Church. They, they relied upon this, Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. You see, here's the thought. We say there is a God. We believe that God is in our life. We have a relationship with God. The people out there don't believe us. But when God shows up in a mighty way, we are vindicated before the eyes of those who are lost. They begin to see through the animation of the Spirit, the great work of God and the glory of God, and that draws people in to hear and understand and give themselves to God. I have one more verse to share with you, and I'm done. This is Hosea chapter. This is a great revival passage. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12 and 13 and I'll be speaking on this verse next Sunday. But notice what he's talking about here. The red part, notice the red letters. Until he comes to rain righteousness upon you. The rain of righteousness falling on God's people, that's the idea of revival. 
It's when God pours out the water of life, the work of the Holy Spirit, drenching his, his people, drenching his church with the presence of the Spirit. And notice how this can come about for us. This is the issue of concern here. Verse 12, so with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness. He's saying, essentially, start making decisions that are, that are decisions based on righteousness, doing the right thing. And you will reap on the basis of what you sow. Of course, that's true in both directions, right? If you sow in righteousness, you will reap in accordance with the kindness of God's grace. If you sow in unrighteousness, that's coming back to haunt you as well, as all of us know. So he begins with that, and then he says this, break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground in this picture is ground that has been left untouched. It's hard. It's, it's very tough to get a shovel in. It's hard, dry ground. And what it needs is someone to dig a, a plow deeply and turn that soil over. The point is you have in your life fallow ground. We all have a little fallow ground in our life that we have protected from the shock of God's plow. And we need to be willing to let God do a work in those areas of our life. To begin to, to break up that fallow ground and begin to sow the seed of grace and mercy and truth into those areas of our life. Notice what he says. Break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord until, until he comes to rain righteousness on you. Here's the truth. He says to his people, you have plowed wickedness. You have been plowing into your life a wicked lifestyle. You have reaped injustice. It's come back on you. You have eaten the fruit of lies. Lies like, you don't need God. Uh, you don't need to go to church. You don't need his word. You don't need to pray. Do your own thing, man. Just live your own life on your own terms. Those are the lies that people are eating. He says, you have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your way, in your numerous wars. You've put your trust in the wrong things. That's why, that's why you're in the place that you're in. It's time to seek the Lord. And you must break up your fallow ground. What I want you to feel with me this morning is this sense of, of God being real and showing up in your life and mine in this church and beginning to manifest his glory. His glory. That's what we want. We want glory in the church. That's called revival. Revival. Will you pray with me? Will you pray, 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 and pray, and pray, and pray, and examine? And will you begin to seek the Lord with me? We can see this come to pass. I believe that with all my heart. Let's pray.